For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. Hi, I'm just going through my voicemails. Let's give one a listen. Hi, David. Uh, my name is Mitch from Colorado. Um, I have a question regarding the Hyperborean myth, uh, namely the Hyperborean conspiracy we see coming up in, in several several forms. You know, a lot having to do with the ancient aliens and all that stuff. Uh, thank you for your program, by the way. I found out about you through History of Psy regarding the pseudo-archaeology episode. Um, and I pretty much listened to most of your stuff, and I look forward to hearing what um, we have to say regarding this, uh, this conspiracy. Have a good day. And thank you, Mitch. Yes, um, I have run across this claim that there was an ancient race of Hyperboreans that some have associated with a lost advanced civilization or with Atlantis or even with ancient aliens. So yes, I will tell you about what we know about Hyperboreans from ancient writings. And then I'll share with you how this legend has been interpreted in more recent times and how it is also linked even with recent events, such as the war in Ukraine. Yeah. The earliest extant ancient writer that talks about the Hyperboreans is Hesiod from the 7th century BCE. He mentions them in a list of peoples, but gives no details except that they are well horsed. The Hyperboreans are not mentioned by name in Homer, but he does mention a chill wind personified as someone called Boreas, which seems to be blowing from somewhere north of Thrace. But the Greek historian Herodotus, writing 200 years later, says Homer refers to the Hyperboreans in the Epigone. Unfortunately, this work has been lost. And that both Homer and Hesiod knew of the myths of the births of the gods Artemis and Apollo on the island of Delos, which Herodotus connects with the Hyperboreans. Another earlier work that Herodotus refers to is the Aramaspia by Aristeus of Proconesus, written around the same time as Hesiod. His work is also lost. We're told that Aristeus claimed that the Hyperboreans lived far to the north, beyond the lands of the Scythians, Cimmerians, Isidones, Aramaspi, and the Griffins who guarded the gold. Aristeus was a traveler and testified that he tried to reach Hyperborea, but never did. He also is the first known source to connect it with the worship of Apollo. But in his account, there seems to have been a mixing of the real world with a fantastical mythical world. Right around the same time, the poet Alcaeus composed his Hymn to Apollo, which contains a reference to the Hyperboreans. This text also is lost, but we have a summary of it from Himerius, a Greek philosopher from the 4th century CE, who had a copy. Here is his summary. When Apollo was born, Zeus equipped him with golden headband and lyre, and gave him also a chariot of swans to drive, and sent him to Delphi and the spring of Castalia, thence to declare justice and right for the Greeks. But when Apollo mounted the chariot, he directed the swans to fly to the land of the Hyperboreans. Now, when the Delphians learned this, they composed a paean and a tune and arranged dancing choruses of youths around the tripod and called on the god to come from the Hyperboreans. Apollo, however, delivered law among the men of that region for a full year, but when he thought that it was time that the tripods of Delphi should ring out too, he ordered his swans to fly back again from the Hyperboreans so that with the blaze of summer and the presence of Apollo, the poet's lyre also adopts a summer wantonness in the account of the god. This doesn't really tell us much of anything about the Hyperboreans, but again, we see the link with Apollo. The implication is that he goes there every winter and returns to Delphi in the summer. Another poet from this time, Simonides, briefly mentions the Hyperboreans, and all he says about them is that they live for a thousand years. By the end of the 6th century BCE, Two traditions had developed about Hyperborea among the Greeks. One that linked it with the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, as we have just seen, and another that linked it to the Oracle of Apollo on the island of Delos. 
the poet Pindar, writing in the 5th century BCE, mentions Hyperborea in several of his odes, often in passing, but he speaks of it as a faraway place, difficult to access. Here's a passage from his 10th Pythian ode, addressing Apollo. Whatsoever splendors we of mortal race may reach, through such he, Apollo, has free course even to the utmost harborage. But neither by taking ship, neither by any travel on foot, to the Hyperborean folk shall you find the wondrous way. Yet of old the chieftain Perseus entered into their houses and feasted among them. When he had lighted on them as they were sacrificing ample hecatombs of asses to their god, Forever in their feasts and hymns has Apollo special joy, and laughs to see the braying ramp of the strange beasts. Nor is the muse a stranger to their lives, but everywhere are stirring to and fro dances of maidens and shrill noise of pipes, and binding golden bay leaves in their hair they make them merry cheer. Nor pestilence nor wasting old age approach that hallowed race. They toil not, neither do they fight, and dwell unharmed of cruel nemesis. Apollo, he says, got to Hyperborea not through usual means. But, he adds, that Perseus, a hero from Greek mythology, happened to light upon it when on his travels he saw some of them sacrificing donkeys. But, note the description of Hyperborea as a place of happiness and long life. The descriptions of it as a utopia multiply in the later sources. Herodotus, who lived around the same time as Pindar, has an even more detailed description. He says the Hyperboreans are reputed to live north, beyond the Scythians, and beyond the Isidones, north of them. Concerning the Hyperborean people, neither the Scythians nor any other dwellers in these lands tell us anything, except perchance the Isidones. And, as I think, even they tell nothing. For were it not so, then the Scythians too would have told even as they tell of the one-eyed men. He then relates how the Delians, the inhabitants of Delos, say that the oracle of Apollo there receives offerings regularly from the Hyperboreans. They never meet any Hyperboreans, but the offerings are said to be passed on from them, exchanging many hands along the way until they reach Delos. Where they actually came from, who knows? But the Delians had a legend, says Herodotus, that the original offerings, the first ones, were brought by two maidens and five men who came straight from Hyperborea. But that when they never returned home, the Hyperboreans decided it was safer not to send gifts directly. But, I should add, Herodotus remains skeptical of the existence of the Hyperboreans. We have a fragment of a work from the later 5th century BCE from someone called Hellenicus of Lesbos. In it, the writer claims the Hyperboreans lived to the north of the Riphian or Ripian mountains. This, by the way, appears to be a mythical mountain range, the location of which we don't know. He also says that the Hyperboreans were people of justice, ate no meat but only wild fruits, and that when people in their society reached 60 years of age, they had them killed. The Greeks, by the way, often described utopian societies as consisting of vegetarians. After this, various writers propose various locations for the Hyperboreans, showing that there was considerable disagreement. Some tried to make the Hyperboreans more historical and realistic by associating them with known people and places. For example, several suggested that the Riphian Mountains were none other than the Alps, and the Hyperboreans simply lived north of them. And they had, in fact, invaded Rome at one point. This seems to be an identification with the Gauls. The work of Eratosthenes, the geographer, who lived in the 3rd century BCE, we no longer have. But the Roman geographer Strabo, who did have Eratosthenes' writings, summarizes some of Eratosthenes' points. And among them is a point about the Hyperboreans. Eratosthenes, you see, takes issue with Herodotus, who was skeptical that the Hyperboreans existed. This charge should be laid against Herodotus that he assumed that by Hyperboreans those peoples were meant in whose countries Boreas does not blow. For even if the poets do speak thus, rather mythically, those at least who expound the poets should give ear to sound doctrine, 
namely that by Hyperboreans were meant merely the most northerly peoples, and as for limits, that of the northerly peoples is the North Pole. Writing in the first century CE, the geographer Pomponius Mila places the Hyperboreans north of the Caspian Sea. He writes, The Caspiani, next to the Scythians, surround the Caspian Gulf. Beyond them, the Amazons are said to be found, and beyond them, the Hyperboreans. He elaborates further later on. The Hyperboreans are located beyond the north wind, above the Riphian Mountains, and under the very pole of the stars, where the sun rises, not every day as it does for us, but for the first time at the vernal equinox, and where it eventually sets at the autumnal equinox. Therefore, for six months, daylight is completely uninterrupted, and for the next six months, night is completely uninterrupted. The land is narrow, exposed to the sun, and spontaneously fruitful. Its inhabitants live in the most equitable way possible, and they live longer and more happily than any mortals. To be sure, because they delight in their always festive leisure, they know no wars, no disputes, and they devote themselves primarily to the sacred rites of Apollo. According to tradition, they sent their first fruits to Delos, initially in the hands of their own virgins, and later they sent them through peoples who handed them on in succession to farther peoples. They preserved that custom for a long time until it was profaned by the sacrilege of those peoples. The Hyperboreans inhabit groves and forests, and when a sense of having been satisfied by life, rather than boredom, has gripped them, they cheerfully wreathe themselves in flowers and actually throw themselves into the sea from a particular cliff. For them, that is the finest death ritual. Pliny the Elder, writing in his book The Natural History around this same time, has more to say about these enigmatic people. Behind these Riffian mountains and beyond the north wind, there dwells, if we can believe it, a happy race of people called the Hyperboreans, who live to extreme old age and are famous for legendary marvels. Here are believed to be the hinges on which the firmament turns and the extreme limits of the revolutions of the stars, with six months' daylight and a single day of the sun in retirement, not as the ignorant have said, from the spring equinox till autumn. For these people, the sun rises once in the year at midsummer and sets once at midwinter. It is a genial region with a delightful climate and exempt from every harmful blast. The homes of the natives are the woods and groves. They worship the gods severally and in congregations. All discord and all sorrow is unknown. Death comes to them only when, owing to satiety of life, after holding a banquet and anointing their old age with luxury, they leap from a certain rock into the sea. This mode of burial is the most blissful. Some authorities have placed these people not in Europe, but on the nearest parts of the coast of Asia, because there is a race there with similar customs and a similar location, named the Ataki. Others have put them midway between the two suns, the sunsets of the Antipodes and our sunrise. But this is quite impossible because of the enormous expanse of sea that comes between. Those who locate them merely in a region having six months of daylight have recorded that they sow in the morning periods, reap at midday, pluck the fruit from the trees at sunset, and retire into caves for the night. Nor is it possible to doubt about this race, as so many authorities state that they regularly send the first fruits of their harvests to Delos as offerings to Apollo, whom they specially worship. These offerings used to be brought by virgins, who for many years were held in veneration and hospitably entertained by the nations on the route, until, because of a violation of good faith, they instituted the custom of depositing their offerings at the nearest frontiers of the neighboring people, and these of passing them on to their neighbors, and so till they finally reached Delos. Later, this practice itself also passed out of use. To make things even more confusing, Diodorus Siculus, writing in the 1st century BCE, associates the Hyperboreans with Britain. The author of the Bibliotheca from the 1st or 2nd century CE places the land of the Hyperboreans near the Atlas Mountains in North Africa. There are many variations of the Hyperborean myth found in the ancient writers. I tried to give you a taste of the earliest and most important, but this summary cannot possibly do the subject full justice. I think it is enough, though, to make clear that in the Greek literary tradition, for the most part, the Hyperboreans were a mythical people living far to the north beyond a range of lofty mountains called the Riphian Mountains. 
they were associated with Boreas, the North Wind, and that's how they got their name. These mountains were perceived as a kind of barrier between the real world and the mythical one, and the Hyperboreans, who worshipped Apollo, lived in a kind of utopia. The Hyperboreans lived long lives, didn't have to work, lived in peace, and had a just society. I realize that some people have supposed that such amazing people could not possibly be from this earth, and so must have been aliens. But as we are familiar with ancient myths and legends and how stories get transmitted and embellished, it's more likely that the legend is either a complete fabrication, since it is set in a location where a paradise could not possibly have existed, or is a distortion and displacement of an originally factual story, referring to a group of people closer to home. We probably will never know. But what could any of that possibly have to do with recent events, as I mentioned earlier? Ancient history, you might think, is so far removed from what is going on in the world today that it is hardly likely to be used in current politics. Eh, you would be surprised. Sometimes it does appear in the discourse. So let's fast forward now from ancient Greece and Rome to Sweden. Yes, Sweden in the early 1600s. We're in early modern Europe now. And at that time, there was an interesting trend in European history writing. National histories were all the rage. And the writers of these histories loved to construct timelines tracing the history of whatever nation they were writing about, all the way back to remote antiquity. The starting point for a history would be events immediately after the Great Flood spoken of in the Bible. The ancestry of the present ruling monarch of a European country would be traced back to one of the early descendants of Noah. By doing so, it added legitimacy and authority to the reigns of these monarchs. They weren't just the descendants of barbarians who overran the Roman Empire. They were older and greater than even the Romans and the Greeks. This antiquarianism involved the study of ancient myths, laws, ruins, documents, landscapes, genealogies, customs, and religion. But it wasn't intellectually rigorous. It was more about seeking evidence to support your pre-existing idea than allowing the evidence to lead you to a conclusion. It was methodologically open. Anything could be used to support the ideas you were promoting, from archaeological excavations to esoteric numerological comparisons of old alphabets, to picking out parts of myths and assuming them to be true. Well, writers in Sweden followed this trend too. They associated themselves with the Goths, who are mentioned in Greek and Roman writings, and it is true that the Goths probably did have their origin around Scandinavia, but they went further. The ruling dynasty of the Swedes was claimed to be descended from Magog, the grandson of Noah, who they say was the forefather of the Goths. This is all largely invented. But this Gothic connection was not satisfying to some. You see, the Goths were, in the popular mind, associated with barbarism. They were the ones that helped to destroy the Roman Empire. So, during the 17th century, a new tradition of research developed in Sweden to solve the problem which identified the Swedes with the Hyperboreans. Scholars of the time tried to establish this link by comparing accounts of the Hyperboreans with Old Norse writings. And they argued that the Goths were not barbarians. They were, in fact, descendants of the Hyperboreans, who were a civilized people, who ruled the Baltic region long before the Greeks and the Romans even existed. This view played a central role in Swedish political and historical discourses at that time. The guy who started all this was Johannes Burius. In his book, Antiquitates Scansianae, he discussed several classical accounts about the Hyperboreans, especially Herodotus and Diodorus, and he compared them with Swedish legends and runes and art and artifacts. He claimed this evidence bore witness to an ancient high civilization at the Swedish city of Uppsala. The Goths were a successor culture to the Hyperboreans. He minimized the achievements of the classical peoples in order to glorify Northern Europeans, saying that the Greeks and Romans and Western Europeans had basically received all the great aspects of their civilization 
from that of the Hyperboreans in the north. The Hyperboreans had the original civilization, and it was pure and unspoiled and highly sophisticated. He was arguing these things during the Thirty Years' War, when Charles IX and Gustavus Adolphus, kings of Sweden, were looking for justification for expansion into new territories, and Burius's ideas were employed for this purpose. Burius even added a prophetic aspect to it all, suggesting this was the beginning of a new golden age, when sacred Hyperborean wisdom was being revived. Of course, a golden age didn't happen, but others after Burius will continue to promote these ideas and elaborate upon them. Most notable among them were Georg Stirnhel, a student of Burius, and Olaf Virelius, whose popular writings brought the identification of the ancient Scandinavians with the Hyperboreans to the attention of intellectuals in Europe more broadly. Now, let's jump ahead to the next century to look at a French astronomer by the name of Jean-Sylvain Bailey. He also happened to be mayor of Paris just before the French Revolution. He ended up getting guillotined. Bailey wrote a series of works in which he linked Hyperborea to the lost civilization of Atlantis. He took two legends and put them together. Bailey adhered to a theory called radical diffusionism. This is the idea that all the cultural inventions and traditions in the world, instead of arising independently in different places, originated from one point and spread out or diffused from there. This was a point of view that already had currency in his time. People had been seeking the Ur civilization, the original. But people weren't looking to known cultures like Egypt or India or anything like that to fill this role. No, they were positing an older predecessor to all the known civilizations. And for some, this Ur civilization was believed to be the Atlantis spoken of in Plato's philosophical dialogues. By this time, Atlantis had become synonymous with technological perfection and high culture. Bailey relocated Atlantis to the north and associated it with Hyperborea. He added a third Greco-Roman tale to all of this, the myth of the Golden Age, which said that humanity has gone through a cycle of ages, each one worse than the one before. At the very beginning was the Golden Age, when everyone lived in peace and prosperity, lived long lives, and the food of the earth grew in abundance without anyone having to work. Although this contradicts somewhat the Atlantean myth of a super sophisticated civilization, they do both describe an ideal form of social organization at the beginning of human history. So, Bailey tried to make it work. In Asia, he supposed, there had existed a white northern European people who were responsible for all the great cultural achievements of the civilizations of the world. He didn't deny the greatness of the East. No, he just credited their accomplishments to the Hyperboreans. Europeans who migrated there and taught them these things. Thus, for him and those who adhered to his views, study and appreciation of the East was another way of honoring Europeans. The story of the human race was now the story of Europeans' travels across the globe. And how could one really disprove what he was saying? He situated the original homeland of the Hyperboreans beyond the scope of empirical inquiry. Its remains he said we're now under the polar ice sheets. Bailey's proofs, if you want to call them that, were sought mostly in myths and legends. They were for him a corrupt record of the past and of a lost sublime original religion. Only by cracking mythology's true code could one reconstruct this religion and uncover what he called the sacred discourse. So then we fast forward again now to the 19th century. Bailey's theory inspired a Russian aristocrat and mystic by the name of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, better known as Madame Blavatsky, who was the co-founder of the Theosophical Society, claiming to have found an ancient book called the Stanzas of Zien while she was in Tibet, a book whose existence has never been verified. She interpreted it using her claimed powers of clairvoyance and published her ideas in 1888 in her book the Secret Doctrine, which relies heavily on the writings of Bailey. In it, she proposes a kind of devolution of the human race, 
from a past ancient ideal to what we have today. It all started in the sacred land, which she places at the North Pole. From there, other continents were populated. On them were the seven original races of humans, and each of these spawned seven sub-races. The first continent that people spread to was Hyperborea, which comprised northern Asia. She describes it as follows. The land of the Hyperboreans, the country that extended beyond Boreas, the frozen-hearted god of snows and hurricanes, who loved to slumber heavily on the chain of Mount Raphaeus, was neither an ideal country, as surmised by the mythologists, nor yet a land in the neighborhood of Scythia and Danub. It was a real continent, a bonified land which knew no winter in those early days, nor have its sorry remains more than one night and day during the year even now. The nocturnal shadows never fall upon it, said the Greeks, for it is the land of the gods, the favorite abode of Apollo, the god of light, and its inhabitants are his beloved priests and servants. This may be regarded as poetized fiction now, but it was poetized truth then. People spread to two other continents as well, she says, Lemuria and Atlantis. These three continents of the world, Hyperborea, Lemuria, and Atlantis, since disappeared. But another, comprising what is now Europe and Asia Minor, remained. Blavatsky speaks of the Aryan race as one of the originals that survived. The Aryan race was born and developed in the far north. Though after the sinking of the continent of Atlantis, its tribes emigrated further south into Asia. For a long time, she says, the Aryans resided with the remaining Atlanteans who taught them their sophisticated technologies, including flying machines. And together, they brought civilization to India, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. All of this, of course, flies in the face of modern science, and the book is filled with all kinds of mystical and fantastical silliness. The book also is highly anti-Semitic. She speaks of the Jews as an artificial Aryan race, and the creators of a degraded religion based on the worship of the phallus. The Aryans, on the other hand, are described as the most metaphysical and spiritual people on earth. Keep in mind that this mentality towards the Jews was common in those days and not unique to her, but she does add cosmological importance to these views. The Jews are thought of as a hindrance to the progress of the races. Theosophical anti-Semitism found a home in Germany before and after the First World War, mixing racism with millenarian fantasies. It was right after the war that the Thule Society was formed. It was named for Ultima Thule, another legendary place spoken about in ancient classical sources. The ancient Greeks spoke of it as the northernmost place in the world. Members of the Thule Society believed it was the capital of Hyperborea. The Thule Society started out as a study group, but under Rudolf von Sabatendorf, it became a political activist and paramilitary group interested in combating Jews and communists, using their antiquarian research as a cover. They were a sponsor of the German Workers' Party. People who would later become famous Nazis were part of this group, but it didn't last long and fell apart in 1919. Ideas about Hyperborea and Atlantis were propagated by others in Germany afterward, such as in the book The Myth of the Twentieth Century, written by Alfred Rosenberg, the head of the Nazi Party's Office of Foreign Affairs, who argued for a prehistoric center of Nordic culture in the North, from which all great civilizations developed. And Heinrich Himmler, who through the organization Annen Erbe, the Institute for Ancestral Research, sought out evidence for the existence of Atlantis in Inner Asia. Please, I don't want you to interpret me in the wrong way here. I'm not trying to say in any way that interest in Hyperborea or Atlantis or exploration of any possible historical fact behind them is anti-Semitic, fascist, or in any other way reprehensible. I'm only trying to show how some people have used these ancient legends for political purposes and how ultimately this will play into current events. So appropriately now, we jump ahead to our own time and to the ideas of a Russian political philosopher by the name of Alexander Dugin, still living. 
the legend of Hyperborea plays into his political views. Dugan uses landscapes and cardinal directions in a symbolic way, referring to it as sacred geography. In it, he distinguishes between east and west. East is the land of the spirit, the paradisal land, the land of perfection, abundance, the sacred homeland in its fullest and most complete form. It is the place of the sun, the light of the world, the material symbol of divinity and the spirit. The west has the opposite symbolic meaning. It is the land of death, the lifeless world, the empire of exile, and the pit of the rejected. It is the anti-East, the country of decay, degradation, and transition from the manifest to the non-manifest, from life to death, from wholeness to need. It is the place where the sun descends. The West is materialistic, atheistic, individualistic, humanistic, and concerned with technology and making money, it is interested in progress and evolution. Dugan associates it with the sea and calls it Atlanticism. The East, on the other hand, he associates with the land. It is traditional, spiritual, corporative, and moral. Instead of democracy and human rights, it tends toward authoritarianism and socialism. Dugan argues that the movements of people and the creation of empires was defined by the primordial logic of sacred geography. Civilizations closer to the East were closer to the sacred, to tradition, to spiritual abundance, while those closer to the West were further from the spirit and decayed and degraded. He also speaks of a dichotomy between North and South, with the North corresponding to spirit, light, purity, completeness, unity, and eternity, and the South symbolizing materiality, darkness, mixture, privation, plurality, and immersion in the stream of time and becoming. The most ancient and primordial layer of tradition unequivocally affirms the primacy of North over South. The symbolism of the North corresponds to the source, to the original Northern paradise from which all human civilization originates. Ancient Iranian and Zoroastrian texts speak of the northern country of Aryanavaya with its capital of Vara, from which the ancient Aryans were expelled by glaciations sent upon them by Ariman, the spirit of evil and opponent of the bright Ormuzud. The ancient Vedas also speak of a northern land as the ancestral home of the Hindus, the Shveta Zvipa, the white land lying in the far north. The ancient Greeks spoke of Hyperborea, the northern island with the capital Thule, this land was considered to be the homeland of the bright god Apollo. In many other traditions, one can detect the most ancient traces, so often forgotten and fragmentary, of this Nordic symbolism. There is harmony in the world, he says, when the South recognizes the authority of the North. When it doesn't, there is conflict. And so, the South is responsible for the conflict. He says there was a great war between North and South in antediluvian times. That's the time before the Great Flood, when Hyperborea and Gondwana, the ancient paleocontinents of North and South, fought. Now, however, the main fight is between East and West. Dugan wants to make it clear that he does not see himself as a racist. Yes, he admits there may be a biological or racial component to all this, but the essence of Nordicism he says, is about character. The man of the North is not simply white, Aryan, or Indo-European in terms of his blood, language, and culture. The man of the North is a particular kind of being endowed with a direct intuition of the sacred. To him, the cosmos is a texture of symbols, each of them pointing toward the first spiritual principle that is invisible to the eye. The man of the North is the solar man, son and mensch, who does not absorb energy as black holes do, but allots it. The streams of creation, light, strength, and wisdom flow out of his spirit. There are no more pure northern or southern peoples anymore, he says, because there have been migrations all around the world. But the dualism between northern and southern types has remained. Pure Nordic civilization disappeared with the ancient Hyperboreans, but its messengers laid the foundations of all present traditions. This Nordic race of teachers stood at the origins of the religions and cultures of the peoples of all continents and colors of skin. Traces of a Hyperborean cult can be found among the Indians of North America, 
among the ancient Slavs, among the founders of the Chinese civilization, and among the natives of the Pacific, among the blonde Germans and the black shamans of Western Africa, among the red-skinned Aztecs, and among the Mongols with their wide cheekbones. There is no people on the planet that does not have a myth about the solar man, Sonnenmensch. True spirituality, the supra-rational mind, the divine logos, and the capacity to see through the world to its secret soul, these are the defining qualities of the North. Wherever there is sacred purity and wisdom, there, invisibly, is the North. No matter what point in space or time we inhabit, the North, looked at in terms of tradition, is a meta-historical and meta-geographical reality. The same can be said about the Hyperborean race. It is not a race in the biological, but rather in a purely spiritual, metaphysical sense. The fight today, Dugan asserts, is between the two parts of the North, the rich North and the poor North, the rich North representing the West and the poor North representing the East. He advocates for the poor North, by which he means Russia, to rise up and oppose the rich North. It must be active and aggressive, rejecting the projects of the Atlanticist West, destroying its plans from the inside and out, combating its stainless efficiency, and thwarting its social and political manipulations. Dugin is the founder of the Eurasia Party in Russia, which is a traditional communist, socially conservative party that aims to build a Eurasian empire led by Russia. For many years, Dugin has been pushing for Vladimir Putin to make this empire a reality. How much Putin adheres to Dugin's philosophies we do not know, but Dugin has been calling for an annexation of Ukraine for quite some time. He does not believe Ukraine has ever been a legitimate state, and its acquisition is an absolute necessity for a Eurasian empire. Without Ukraine, Russia will never be able to become a full-fledged sovereign power, an empire, an independent pole of a multipolar world. This means that the fate of unipolarity and globalism depends on whether the West is able to pull away Ukraine. After all, if Russia and Ukraine unite, one way or another, unipolarity will collapse and the geopolitical map will change irreversibly again. And so we finally get to how ancient Hyperborea is connected to the war in Ukraine. Clearly, it is not crucial or instrumental to it. It's not that the legend is the cause of the conflict. It merely is a rhetorical tool employed in the Eurasianist discourse. But now, if you see it, you know what it means and why it's being used. Sometimes it even takes on eschatological meaning. Over the course of this struggle, the flame of the resurrection of the spiritual north, the flame of Hyperborea, will transform geopolitical reality. The new global ideology will be that of final restoration, putting a final end to the geopolitical history of civilizations. But this will not be the end which the globalist spokesmen of the end of history have theorized. The materialistic, atheistic, anti-sacred, technocratic, Atlanticist version of the end will give way to a different epilogue, the final victory of the sacred avatar, the coming of the great judgment, which will grant those who chose voluntary poverty the kingdom of spiritual abundance, while those who preferred wealth founded on the assassination of the spirit will be condemned to eternal damnation and torment in hell. Lost continents will arise out of the abysses of the past. Invisible meta-continents will appear in reality. A new earth and a new heaven will arise. I hope that answered your question. If any of you out there would like to send me a message and possibly have it answered here in a video, you can do so at speakpipe.com slash davidmiano. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that for as little as $2 per month at patreon.com slash worldofantiquity. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.